rabbit's pastoral multocida causes a whole constellation of diseases from the upper respiratory tract all the way down to the lungs and possibly including abscessation as well. Rhinitis or snuffles is sort of a very cutely named disease, but potentially very serious for the health of these animals. It can progress to pneumonia if these organisms make their way down into the lungs. We can also see conjunctivitis or WPI, ear infections, either otitis media or interna, which can be associated with a head tilt, and then abscessation anywhere in the body. This is a very common infection in domestic rabbits, and it's highly contagious. So readily transmitted with direct contact. The clinical signs vary with the site of infection and really range from a very mild upper respiratory disease with snuffles all the way through to sepsis and death. Pastorella multocida is commonly carried by rabbits, so 30 to 90 percent of animals um, are carriers, and so it's an organism that many of them will be exposed to at some point. I've put a link to a video above where you can see a rabbit with snuffles um, sneezing to give you some idea of what the very mild uh, rhinitis form of this disease looks like. In birds, Pastorella multocida causes avian cholera, and this affects both our domestic species as well as wild birds. We can characterize avian cholera as either acute or chronic. Um, in acute disease, we see fulminant septicemia and oftentimes apparently just sudden death within hours. Chronic disease follows the acute disease and occurs when we have infections caused by less, less pathogenic strains, so the birds don't die right away. We can see localized infections and swelling of the joints and wattle in chickens, and dyspnea if there's respiratory involvement. The mortality rate for avian cholera can be very, very high, so I read one report where they described 68% mortality uh, in a poultry flock. These infections oftentimes cause sepsis, and in this image on the left here, what I'm showing is a microscopic view of some heart blood collected from a bird with foul cholera. So heart blood is a commonly collected uh, sample when you have avian species that die. It's a great place to identify those organisms responsible for the sepsis. And what I think you can appreciate are some of these bipolar staining organisms. So maybe particularly this one here, you can see we have darkened ends with maybe a slight area of lucency in the middle, highly suggestive of pastorella. It's that safety pin morphology. In outbreak situations, the organism is uh, uh, transmitted uh, from excretions from the mouth. So we get fluids from the mouth getting into the water, whether that's the waterers in a barn or in uh, an environmental setting into a lake. Chronically infected birds uh, are assumed to be the source for flocks, so we have carrier animals that are present. And for our domestic species, uh, wildlife reservoirs can potentially be the source. So biosecurity is very, very important on farms. We want to prevent our poultry species, our chickens and turkeys, from coming into contact with wild birds. This is critical not only for avian cholera, but also other uh, viral diseases like influenza and Newcastle disease. Importantly, mammalian strains of Pastorella multocida, so those from either pigs or cats, can also be pathogenic for birds. In Canada, avian cholera is an immediately notifiable disease in domestic birds, and so your first call has to be to the CFIA, but it's actually quite common in wildlife. So the way that we handle these diseases in a domestic bird setting um, is really going to be dictated by regulation. Elsewhere in the world, antimicrobials can be employed uh, to combat these infections. As I mentioned, avian cholera is common in waterfowl, and I've put a link to a really nice uh, brief news story above where an outbreak of avian cholera in the United States is described. In cats, Pastorella multocida infections are associated with bites, licks, and scratches. So those free-roaming outdoor cats that get into fights and get cat abscesses, probably you're going to be seeing Pastorella multocida. It's also a common cause of pyothorax, and it may also play a role in gingivostomatitis. Um, remember, cats sometimes bite dogs, um, and so we can see this in canine abscesses as well. Treatment for these infections 
oftentimes relies on beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations, so drugs like amoxicillin with clavulanic acid. And on the right, I've put a, a summary of a table that I've reproduced out of this paper here, um, describing bacteria associated with pyothorax in almost 100 dogs and cats. What I really want to highlight here is just how common Pastorella species are. So you can see that of the 47 dogs with pyothorax, five of them had Pastorella multocida. And in cats, Pastorella multocida was recovered from pyothorax in approximately a third of these cases. So not just an agricultural pathogen. For anyone who sees themselves working in companion animal practice, I would direct you to these ABCD guidelines from the Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery. This is always a really great place to get updated uh, guidelines on the management of feline diseases. Human infections with Pastorella multocida are also encountered and are almost always cat associated. So cats bite cats resulting in abscesses, they bite dogs resulting in abscesses, and sometimes they bite people resulting in infections as well. This organism is found in the mouths of up to 90% of healthy cats, so it's very, very common. Um, and while bites would be the number one cause, non-traumatic contact is also recognized. And the way that this presents is with the rapid development of swelling, cellulitis, and redness. There have also been reports of bone and joint infections, respiratory tract infections, and endocarditis associated with non-traumatic contact. And in very rare instances, uh, infections of the central nervous system. Seeking medical treatment uh, following a cat bite is very, very important. These infections develop rapidly and uh, can, can quickly necessitate hospitalization and IV antibiotics. Our final organism today is Avibacterium paragallinarum. This causes an acute respiratory illness in birds. Um, we see it in chickens, pheasants, guinea fowl, and quail. And it's characterized by nasal discharge, sneezing, and swelling of the face. So here we have some pathological lesions on quail heads. And I think you can appreciate just how swollen these uh, sort of periorbital tissues are. It almost looks like the birds are squinting. You can imagine that it, they must really have felt like they had a cold, really congested feeling sinuses. This is a production limiting disease. And generally speaking, losses are due to decreased egg production and increased carcass condemnations, as opposed to mortality events. Avibacterium paragallinarum is transmitted by droplets or aerosols, and chronically infected birds are thought to be the source. Management of this disease relies heavily on all-in, all-out type practices, so not mixing animals uh, from different cohorts. Samples to collect really depends on the site of infection. So in cases of sepsis, we want to collect the abdominal viscera, the spleen, uh, potentially samples from the long bones, uh, and blood, heart blood. Remember in cases of avian cholera, where we have septic birds, uh, sampling that heart blood can be a really great place to culture organisms responsible for the infection. In respiratory disease in cattle, uh, post-mortem collected lung tissue can be really useful. Uh, both to see the distribution of the lesions and also to culture the organisms present. Um, we can also look at nasal secretions. Respiratory tract infections in pigs and rabbits, we want to look for exudates, crusts, um, and potentially deep nasal swabs. Of course, if we see mastitis, we want to collect milk. Uh, hemorrhagic septicemia, we can submit ear tips, anti-mortem, so if we still have live animals, um, and we can see the organisms uh, in blood recovered from those tissues. If we were to have a pyothorax or abscesses in our companion animal species, aspirates or swabs would be the samples to collect. These organisms are easily grown on blood agar and can be readily identified either biochemically or by Malditoff. Microscopy can be very useful, so a presumptive diagnosis of Pastorella multocida can be made uh, by seeing those safety pin-like organisms and then histological examination of biopsy specimens or tissues collected at necropsy can be really helpful in seeing the bacteria in situ. Pastorella multocida is an important zoonosis. It's an important cause of infection following cat bites. Um, you need to take these bites seriously. 
Um, remember, cats have really long, sharp, narrow teeth, and their bites can result in deep, penetrating wounds that don't allow the sort of normal protective things we associate with wounds to occur, like bleeding, flushing out all those bacteria. Not only is zoonotic transmission important, but we do have evidence of sharing Pastorella multocida between animal species. Other genera within the Pastorella AC are not super common or important uh, zoonoses. I mentioned this earlier, but I just wanted to highlight that we don't always require traumatic contact in order to have uh, potentially serious infections in people from Pastorella isolated from animals. So I have a few interesting case reports here. Um, in this first one, the owner reported that she frequently uh, kissed her dog's face and would feed it by transferring food from her mouth into the dog's mouth directly. Um, this person went on to develop Pastorella multocida meningitis. And then in this next case series, um, there were a number of uh, instances of non-traumatic contact. So in the first case, um, the cat was reported to steal the baby's pacifier and use it as a toy. The baby would then put that pacifier back into its mouth and was in contact in that way. And the second case, uh, the dog was reported to lick the baby's face, although there was never any traumatic contact. There were no scratches or bites on the infant. So transmission doesn't always require obvious trauma. In the last few years, a new genus of pastoral AC was identified in koala, Lone pinella species were identified um, in bite wounds on people from a koala in Queensland, Australia. And while this organism may be a very niche species, unless you're living in Australia, um, what I really want to emphasize here is that in cases of bite wounds, you want to think pastoral AC. Organisms within this family commonly live within the mouth and can be inoculated into your tissues or the tissues of another animal uh, through a bite. Treatment options are highly dependent on what your host species is and the site of infection. Um, there may be national disease control strategies, so fowl cholera or avian cholera, um, which would be stamped out in Canada and we wouldn't be using antimicrobials. There is some emerging resistance that you need to be aware of, particularly in those pathogens um, involved in bovine respiratory disease complex or shipping fever. Um, there are reports of increasing resistance to macrolide type drugs. Um, among some of these uh, bacterial pathogens we've talked about today. Have a few new terms, and of course, some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.